My name is Auntie Vera Oskal. I'm 27 years old, and I live in the northern part of Norway. Here, all the Sami families live in herds, and I work with my father, as is the tradition. But today, because of global warming, things have changed. Our work is becoming more difficult. It's for this reason that I want to testify. Because I'm concerned for my future and that of my family. The tundra, the ancestral home of the Samis, who used to be called the Laps. The Samis live beyond the polar circle, astride the Arctic land of four countries, Sweden, Finland, Russia, and Norway. Situated 1,800 kilometers north of Oslo, in the county of Finnmark, the city of Kautokino is the cultural center of the 40,000 Norwegian Samis. According to legend, the Samis have lived in this land forever. Christianized and settled, these native people have suffered over time from strong political assimilation and forced integration. Despite these strains that have marked the end of their nomadic life, the Samis have retained many of their customs. They remain united by their culture, that of the reindeer. Today, reindeer herding sets the pace for the life of the Samis all year round. The reindeer spend the spring and the summer in pastures close to the coast. At the end of autumn, they return to the Kautaukino region where they stay for winter. The slaughtering is traditionally done in September. Kautaukino is slowly getting out of its winter slumber. And as it is customary, in the beginning of February, the meat is smoked outside of the houses. The first skins are put to dry. The whole reindeer is used by the Samis. The fur to make clothes, the antlers to make tools and objects of art, and the meat, of course, to eat and sell. I left school rather early. I've worked on the family farm since I was 15 years old. When I was little, I used to come into the warehouse to look and touch the reindeer skin. They were like treasure. I've always loved their touch, their smell. All the skins you see here, I prepared them myself. My father is 53 years old. His name is Mathis. He's the one who taught me everything. He started working with his dad at the age of eight. Three years ago, our mother died. We are four children in the family. My two older brothers have already left home. I've stayed home to help my dad with the reindeer. Marit, my sister, still lives with us. She's the one who looks after the house. Recently, my fiance Ristin has moved in with us. Her family are also herders, but she went to university. Marit and Ristin spend all their free time making clothes and making things that they can sell at the cooperative. Here it's the women that deal with that. Today, the Sami community faces a dark future. In the northern part of Norway, global warming heralds a disaster. The disappearance of the entire economic sector and a rural way of life based on herding. At the University of Kautaukino, this menace is taken seriously. This building houses an international observatory entirely dedicated to the herding of reindeer. Here, in addition to regular studies, the students can also take classes on climatology and practical work on the herding techniques. But the role of the university, inaugurated in 2009 and partially financed by the Norwegian government, 
is still badly received by a rural and austere world, not yet modernized. Anders Oskell, the director of the observatory, is aware of the menace. According to the climatic models, the temperatures in that region will increase by 0.8 degrees to 1.5 degrees per decade for the next 100 years. When we talk to the different reindeer herding peoples, it's fair to say that they don't seem to conceive it today as a major challenge. Um, of course, reindeer herding peoples have lived with climate variability for a long, long time. And nature is something that they know and, and, and feel they understand. But of course, if climate change comes on top of everything else, the land use changes, the globalization processes, the social economic factors, then of course it, it's going to be a very hard toll on, on these cultures, on these societies. At the end of the polar night, at the beginning of February, we leave our home in Katakino. We go into the tundra to gather the herd, where they spent the winter. For several months, my father and I will stay there. Also, during the large migration, we'll take our herd to the summer pasture. It'll happen five weeks after Easter, as it always has. Long, frosty winters, blizzards, and extreme temperatures. The tundra climate is rough. Its ecosystem is characterized by a layer of vegetation at ground level. But over the past few years, global warming has changed the natural characteristic of the subarctic regions. Scientists have been measuring a northern migration of the forest's border. In the last 30 years, it has moved nearly 50 kilometers. Due to constantly increasing temperatures, a later winter and an earlier spring, some species of trees, like the dwarf birch and willow, proliferate and colonize the tundra. They are attaching themselves to a territory that used to look like a great white desert. In this region in particular, there's a lot of shrubs spreading into the tundra region. That might be a challenge for, for several reasons. One of them being that in some parts, uh, herders tell us that it's even difficult to migrate through. Uh, so it's a practical problem. But also in wintertime, if you have a lot of shrubs and then you have a lot of wind, uh, this would pack the snow harder. In fact, I hear the elders say that the tundra is not like it used to be. Because I'm young, I've always seen the trees. But I do see some changes each year. Seasonal rhythms are never the same. But here we have a saying that one year is not the twin sister of another year. These kind of constraints, it's part of our daily lives. There's no doubt that nature has changed. There are more trees than before. I don't even know if my grandfather or even my father would recognize this region today. Yes, for sure the environment is different, but is it really because of global warming? What has not changed is the way that we raised reindeer. Anyhow, us, the reindeer herders, we know that we have to withstand climactic risk, even if it becomes more and more difficult. The progression of the forest has also changed the routes that they must take to get to the herds. The result has doubled the time it takes to move them as well. Mathis and Auntie Bera Oskel are often surprised by the darkness when they rally their herds in the winter, 
situated about 150 kilometers north of Kautokino. Don't you hear the bells? We can hear the bells. Do you not hear them? No, I hear nothing. They are far off, but we can hear them. We can hear them. Are you deaf or what? Why? Mathis and Auntie Bera Oskel will stay four months in the tundra. During their long stay, this chalet will be their shelter. In the region, each family owns a chalet in the outskirts of their land. These cabins have replaced the lavo, the traditional reindeer skin tents that were used when they watched over their herds up to the late 1960s. Come here, dog. You go towards the hills, and I will follow the river. We will meet near the lake. Finding the reindeer is long and tiring work. The days start at 4 o'clock in the morning with the same ritual, identifying reindeer tracks. Finding their footprints is crucial to track a herd and is dependent on the quality of the snow. snow is not like it used to be. Its consistency changes all the time. It is too heavy, it is too light. It is also more humid. It freezes more easily and regularly. There is a crust of ice that forms on the surface. Sometimes we need several days to find the reindeer. And also, everything melts too fast at the end of winter. How do we find the reindeer with no snow? Are we to go on foot? For us, language is very important for our job. There are many different words, for example, to describe the type of snow. We have over 300 words to describe it. Today, the old ones don't know how to write certain words for snow because they've never seen it. They just don't have the words. The following morning, the first group of reindeer are finally seen about 20 kilometers north of the chalet. Here, I found them. Well, they are on the other side of the river. They are too spread out. How many groups are there? I don't know. 10, maybe 12? It looks like it's frozen. It'll take a long time to gather them. Oskel's herd is composed of about 2,000 reindeer. In the tundra, each herding family has the right to exploit the territory of more than tens of thousands of hectares to let the reindeer roam freely. From October until the end of April, the reindeer eat the grass, bark, and lichen that they find under the snow. To find food necessary for their survival, the reindeer travel regularly in groups of three to five hundred. When the reindeer digest the lichen, it ferments naturally in their digestive system and generates heat. This allows the reindeer to lower their energy in order to survive the long winter in the tundra.
Small group by small group, Mathis and Antibera Oskel gather their reindeer. Soon, the animals will form a single and unique herd. Once the animals are together, the herders will watch over them constantly to make sure the reindeer do not wander off and get lost again in the tundra. The dogs are the ones traditionally in charge of keeping the herd together once they are formed. For four months, until the beginning of May, Mathis and his son will also make sure the reindeer get enough food until their departure to the summer pasture, which is situated about 600 kilometers to the west. The animals have to preserve their strength as the migration is very stressful, especially for the young and the pregnant females. We have this, you know, the word ala is, is a Sami word, meaning uh, good posture or good posture conditions. And it sort of reflects, uh, uh, well, not only that there is food underneath the snow, but also the access through the snow. So. So access through snow in the critical winter months uh, is, is uh, important. And if this is to continue as a nomadic livelihood, which it is today, the access to pastures is, of course, uh, important. It's important uh, in a pastoralistic uh, adaptation. It's important to have access to pastures that you use more regularly, but also pastures that, that you need if nature does dip this or that. For example, the reindeer have easy access to the lichen under the snow. But our days start earlier and earlier. When we can, we inspect the pastures that are around the herds, and we even go and inspect them later if we have to. We have to be certain that the reindeer always have something to eat before we go to the summer pastures. It looks good here. Yes, the snow looks good. Thick, but easy to dig. It's good snow. And there are a lot of lichens here. All of this is good. Oh, but wait, wait. There is some ice. All the lichen is stuck in the ice. The reindeer will never be able to penetrate this ice. It is too hard. We will have to go somewhere else, and fast. It is not good here. What's happening? It must have rained in the autumn, and it has turned into ice before the first snowfall. Or the snow melted and froze again due to the cold. We need to check to see that this whole pasture is not frozen. It's really bad. The herd must really eat well so that they can gain weight. We will have to keep moving them before the big departure. Hey, 
With the arrival of winter later and later, the increasing of temperatures in the autumn rain, there is more and more ice in the pastures. It's really bad. If the ice forms in autumn, it will stay and even get thicker when it gets colder. All the lichens will remain imprisoned in the ice. But what I mainly see is the reindeer herding is becoming more difficult and it is costing us more, and we are getting back less and less. We are not making the meat more expensive, it's the opposite. For the herders, constantly moving the herds before the change of season is exhausting. When there's ice in the pasture, we move the herds day and night. We practically never sleep. Also, I have to deal with the animals to make sure we eat when we're in the tundra. I know that the animals have lost weight. You just have to look at this one. He's so skinny. We work for nothing. The more we work, the less we gain. Mikkel Triumph runs the only reindeer slaughterhouse in the region of Kautaukino. Until 2000, he used to buy between 10 to 15,000 reindeer from different herders in the region. But today, he buys less as the market in the Scandinavian countries narrows and the export of the meat to Poland and Germany has declined. When the reindeer are no longer young, you can see it immediately in the quality of the meat. It's normal in the sense as the animals are tired and stressed from lack of food. It's definitely a consequence of global warming. To have good reindeer meat, the weather should not be too hot. They need consistent winters. You know, here the reindeer meat is considered a luxury. It's a meat that is more expensive than others and it has to be perfect. If the past years of lesser quality, it has an impact on the meat. It's not as good and I would sell less. It is why I am buying less and I am paying the herders less to reduce the risk of being overstocked and losing money. Today, the butchers buy reindeer meat at around three to four euros per kilo, which is 25% less than 10 years ago. In the same time frame, the costs to herders have multiplied by three. For Niles Henrik Sara, the situation is critical. I too am a herder, but today I spend the better part of my time accounting for our difficulties and reporting on a situation that is worsening season after season. I have to say that the government helps me very little nowadays. We are more and more isolated. Because of global warming and the economic difficulties that it causes, I am frightened that the herding profession will disappear in the next little while. In any case, the tradition that we know has practically disappeared. Where can we bring them to now? Here, we either have nothing left or it's frozen. Yes, yes. It takes so long to move them. Yes, but do you have another solution? No, it's really frozen. This is the first time I've seen my father so worried. Me too, I'm worried. I'm questioning myself, is this life really for me? What other profession can I do? I don't know how to do anything else. Perhaps I should go listen to Riston and go to university. Traditionally, during Easter holidays, the herders forsake their animals to go into Kautaukino. They leave the isolation and the difficulties that are accumulating in the tundra to join their families. These reunions give the Samis the opportunity to wear their gakti, the ceremonial clothes. Each family has their own motifs, 
and their own colors, which are always on their flag, red, blue, yellow, and green. As much as their language, traditional songs, and the reindeer, their clothing is an important part of the Sami identity. Get that. For my father, it's very important that I go to the reindeer race wearing a gakti. He doesn't seem to realize that there are less and less people in the community wearing the traditional clothes. These festivals are becoming more and more like folklore. Today, the clothing mainly amuses the tourists who take our photos. Does it make sense for us to continue dressing like this? My friends from university dress like any other person. I'm sure Riston has put on her clothes today to not upset her father. But we take part in a traditional reindeer race. Sometimes I feel as if I'm living in a frozen world, that nothing has changed. How will our traditions serve us if we're condemned by global warming? There, you see, it's my grandfather. At the time, he used these round slits to transport everything with him around the tundra. Here's my grandfather and Mikhail's grandfather. Here's your mother's grandmother, Auntie Inga, her uncle, and Auntie Makreta. And here's father, with his reindeer in Lagofjord. I was on the verge of going towards the summer pastures. How old is this photo? I don't know. 35, 40 years? In any case, it's not yesterday. <laughs> no, that is for sure. In addition to the appearance of new tree species and the modification of the seasonal rhythms, the alternating of frequent thaws and intense cold also has a heavy consequence on the reindeer. Worried about his herd, Mathis Oskal returns to the tundra. During the Easter holidays, the temperature dropped suddenly after it had been warm for several days. Everywhere, the snow is covered by a film of ice that will get thicker if the temperature continues to drop. The reindeer have finished eating the last of the available resources in the pasture where they have been left. They leave nothing but scrawny bushes behind. They are once again dispersed and in small groups, roaming the tundra, looking for something to eat. The weaker ones, lacking in food, are finding it hard to keep up with the rhythm of the herd. If the cold intensifies again, the reindeer will no longer be able to dig in the snow. And even if the stronger ones survive, they will not be able to get at the lichens that are trapped in the ice. 
In these critical situations, the reindeer can lose up to 40% of their weight in the last months of winter. Some eventually die of exhaustion. In 2006 and 2007, dozens of herders in the region lost half of their herds. Having stayed in Kautokino, Auntie Bera has been warned of the situation in the tundra by his father. When famine strike, we bring food to the reindeer. We did that already three years ago, in the middle of the polar night. At the time, my two brothers were still here to help me. I can only bring small quantities of food on my sleigh, and we should still deliver a ton of hay tomorrow. I should have stayed longer in Kautokino with Ristin. She suggested that I go with her to take a class at university. But I really have to go help my father. When they have no other option, the herders have to feed the reindeer themselves. But the feed is expensive. Every cost rises, like the oil. The more they roam the tundra, the more fuel they need to use. This practice jeopardizes a population in an already fragile economic state. In 2009, the revenue of a Norwegian reindeer herder was less than one-third of an industrial worker. You should return fast and bring a larger quantity. It takes a lot of energy to feed the animals. Plus there's risk at this time of year that the reindeer will die from eating hay. It's a rich source of food, a lot richer than lichen. It's harder to digest and the animals can die from indigestion because they eat too much when they're hungry. In 1970, there were 30,000 reindeer herders in Kautaukino. Today, there are less than 1,500 herders, and they are getting smaller and smaller. How many will remain tomorrow if the herding conditions get harder? If it rains when it is not supposed to? More and more often, the younger generation are hesitating to take over the family business. They feel powerless against global warming. This time, I won't go back in the tundra. Ristin has convinced me to enroll in the university. At the International Observatory of Reindeer, everyone thinks that it's time to act now if we want to get out of this. There must be solutions to adapt to global warming. I've decided to take a special course specific to young herders, to those who already have experience. Here, as well as learning, I can speak to people my age. We'll feel less alone Let's discourage about confronting the future. The challenge today is to be able to adapt, adjust our traditions to the new reality. It may be climatic or economic. 
This is a challenge that certain young herders have decided to meet, and that is positive. But to get there, they must reinvent everything that has been established over the centuries. I think to embrace the world of science is to embrace the whole world and to have a chance to uncover how it is in the rest of the world. The elder generation have a lot to gain if the younger ones studies. They can relay the information. They can warn people on what will happen in the future and that would be nothing but positive for all the herders. Thanks to Anders Oskal, I learned that it's possible to modify the herding cycle of the reindeer. I understood that nothing was stopping us from modifying the migration calendar if the conditions require it. And most of all, we need to speak, to exchange, not remain alone and carry the whole burden. Anders also gave me a gift when he heard that I had never left this region. He gave me my first flight with a pilot who regularly does aerial observations for the university. Today, Kautaukino is one of the most extensive communities in Norway. Every year, new arrivals come and settle, lured by the promise of work or a life made easier due to global warming. The tundra, one of the last large virgin areas on the surface of the world, covers more than 8 million square kilometers, which is 6% of the world's land surface. Today, Hotels and tourist complexes have invaded everywhere. They flourish along the way towards Kautaukino. It started 30 years ago when the entire region was opened up for commerce. At the end of the 1980s, despite a large number of protests and a long legal battle, a dam and a hydroelectric power plant were built on the Sami's ancestral land. Several hundred kilometers were flooded. Since then, more and more power lines have been added to the refineries that have flourished in the coastal areas, and they divide the tundra like barbed wire. With global warming, exploitation of natural resources has become possible. These have a considerable impact on the size of the herding zones. They prevent access and interfere with reindeer migration. Gold, diamonds, copper, silver. Northern Norway is rich with mineral resources previously inaccessible due to the cold and the length of winter. Recently, in the Kautaukino region, a marble quarry was opened, involving dozens of kilometers of road, which hinders many of the pastures. Today, more than ever, the pressures in the tundra are strong, and the older generation of nomads are forced to adapt. In order to continue their lifestyle, their culture must evolve. To adapt, to let go of tradition, so that one day our reindeer don't end up in a farm, behind a fence. We must now gather our animals and leave for the summer pasture. If we don't do it, it means I went to university for nothing. I left my father in the tundra for nothing. What I've just seen from the helicopter is really worrying. Yes, yet here we're less invaded than in coastal regions. You should have seen some of the summer pastures. They are even constructing another refinery. Now some people are even talking about building wind turbines out there. Soon it will come here. What do you think? Each time it's the same. When the state wants something, they don't think of consulting us. What we should do is attempt to establish a dialogue with the companies coming to build here. 
And they work better with the institutions and their administrations. We have to make them understand that we must protect our lands and our herds. How are the lichens in the tundra these days? The situation, I think, is critical enough. There's still ice and frozen rain, but the summer pastures are good. I think we should have taken our reindeer there a long time ago already. Yes, but you can ask your neighbors to help you. Yeah, I know, but you know how it is. I don't know how long the tradition has been that we move the animals the same date every year. All the herders do this. They respect the calendar. Maybe, but today you really need to forget that. Otherwise, we'll never get there. So you had better gather up the herd as fast as possible. I have to speak about all this with my father, even if it will be hard to convince him. He must agree to move the reindeer now. We must talk with the other herders. We don't have any other choice. Of course, for us, we don't like to meddle in other people's business. The Sammies always keep their problems at home. They are proud people, and my father is the proudest. It's been harder on him since the death of my mother. Despite the fatigue, despite the discouragement, he never complains. He never asks for help. A few days later, a few herders complete a fence near Mathis's cabin. The enclosure can hold 7,000 reindeer. Five families have agreed, together and for the first time, to gather their animals and to leave the tundra a month ahead of schedule. The animals will be sorted by their owners and then taken to the summer pastures. In the tundra, because they have to look for food, the reindeer have mixed together. The herder's tactic is simple. They are going to gather the animals in seven large groups and direct them one by one into the enclosure. Working together will allow the families to reduce their operating costs and to be more efficient in gathering different groups. <laughs> In a few hours, the herders gather the first group. But what still remains is the last step, getting the animals to enter the enclosure. Scared by the snowmobiles, the animals panic, and the last step turns into a rodeo.
sorting begins immediately. A group of herders have already gone to collect the other reindeer. To recognize their animals, a member of each family enters the arena. The reindeers are identified by a unique marking that the owners have placed on the body or ears. In addition to advancing the date and joining together to prepare for the migration, the herders have also allowed, for the first time, scientific equipment from the Norwegian National Institute of Schooling and of the Protection of Nature. Now, a biologist and a veterinarian will study a group of 500 reindeers in the span of five years to better understand their strategies in adapting to global warming. The climate has an uh, impact on the reproduction of the reindeer. We see that uh, through, uh, through studies through the last 20 years. We see that there seems to be two strategies of reproduction in reindeer in Norway. The northernmost reindeer, for example, here in Finnmark, which have access to continental winter pastures, they seem to reproduce every year, but the size of the reindeer are smaller. Then you have the more southern populations that don't have access to these good winter pastures, which seems to buffer every second year. So they, that means that instead of uh, reproducing, they increase their own weight to buffer the winter uh, instead of reproducing. Yeah. Thanks to this study, advice from researchers in Kautaukino, and also their traditional know-how, the herders can adapt rather than become vulnerable. Faced with unfavorable climatic conditions, they can change their migration calendar, staying longer in one zone or another so that the animals can graze. They can also increase or decrease the number of animals slaughtered depending on the number of births. They can also find a better diversity within their herd of age, sex, size, and color of the animals they wish to sell. Despite the threats that continue to weigh down on them, a small group of herders have decided to fight. Soon, others will follow, and after dark days, hope will return. Is everything all right, children? I have a question to ask you. What do we call the rope behind the neck of the reindeer? Lafzi. Lafzi. Good. Would you like a ride now? You know, since I go as often into the tundra, I dress up the reindeer so that they can bring people for a walk. Would you like to try? Yes. So on we go. A new winter has begun. Mathis Oskell is diversifying his business. He looks after his herd less. For the past six months, he has given reindeer drawn sled rides, taking the children from the region to school. This activity brings in additional revenue, but it also allows him to pass along the traditions of the Sami people to younger generations. The Samis have already proven that over time, they can adapt. United and solidified, they become even stronger and are able to cross the barriers that continue to stand before them. My name is Antti Vera Oskel. I'm 27 years old and I live in the northern part of Norway. Like my father, I'm a reindeer herder. It's the profession I have chosen.